Good morning. I'm Dr. Alaa Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. Today I wanted to discuss with you all the complete perineal tear and direct to vaginal fistula. What we wanted to discuss today, the definition, the etiology, classification, and the prevalence of perineal tears, diagnosis and the treatment of complete perineal tear, etiology, diagnosis, and treatment of rectovaginal fistula. As you see in this picture, this is a third degree perineal tear, and this is a fourth degree perineal tear, and this is rectovaginal fistula in this part. Let us start with the anatomy of the perineal body, which is the central tendon of the perineum. It is a fibromuscular mass in the midline of the perineum at the junction between the urogenital triangle and the anal triangle. It is found between the vulval opening and the anus posterior. So this is this part is the perineal body. The perineal body is the meeting of different types of muscles from both sides, like the external anal sphincter. The transverse perineal muscle, superficial and deep. The bulbocavernosus muscle, this area. And the fibers also from external urinary sphincter. And the puborectal is part of the levator benign muscle, in this part. This is the puborectal portion of the levator. The perineal body is essential for integrity of the pelvic floor. Its rupture during the vaginal birth leads to widening of the gap between the anterior free borders of the levator ani muscle of both sides, thus predisposing the woman to prolapse of the uterus and rectum and sometimes the bladder also. The perineum has a rhomboid shape, as you see in the picture, and transverse line from the two ischial tuberosity or the transverse perineal muscle divide the perineum into two triangles. Urogenital triangle contain the urogenital organs and posterior or anal triangle containing the anus and the anal canal and the esquirectal fossa and the rectovaginal Septum. The line that divides the two triangles are extremely formed of the transverse muscles of the perineum. Fits on the ischial tuberosity lateral. This is the ischial tuberosity. And makes it the fibers in the midline contributing to create the perineal body here extending from ischial tuberosity to perineal body here. The posterior border of the superficial perineal fascia joins the perineal body. Superiorly, it is attached to the rectovaginal septum. What about the old complete perineal tear? It is unhealed third and the fourth degree of obstetrical tear which involves vaginal wall, skin, perineal muscles, anal sphincter, and the mucosa of the anal canal and rectum. This is an example in this picture, extension of the perineal tear from the vagina to the perineum, perineal body, and the external anal sphincter. It occurs due to non-sutured or non-healed perineal tear. The etiology of perineal tear may be one of three, lack of elasticity of perineal tissue, example in elderly primary bara or presence of an old scar in the perineum, overstretching of the perineum during labor due to large sized head of the fetus as in picture, or forces delivery or contracted outlet, or due to rapid stretching of the perineum in precipitate labor. 
The classification of perennial tear include four degrees. First degree, the tear include the vaginal mucosa and the perennial skin. Second degree, the tear include the vaginal mucosa, perennial skin, and the perennial muscle. Third degree, the vaginal mucosa, the perennial skin, the perennial muscle, and external inner sphincter. And we can divide uh, the third degree into 3A, less than 50% of external anal sphincter sickness torn. 3B, more than 50% of external anal sphincter sickness torn. 3C, external anal sphincter torn and internal sphincter also. What about the fourth degree? Fourth degree include tear in the vaginal mucosa, perineal skin, perineal muscle, external and internal anal sphincter, and anal mucosa or rectal mucosa. Third degree, as we said, 3A, B, and C, and the fourth degree. There is injury to the perineum involving the anal sphincter complex, external and internal anal sphincters, and the anorectal mucosa. As you see in the picture, you can see the internal anal sphincter in this area. This is the internal anal sphincter, and this is the external anal sphincter, which is divided into three parts, subcutaneous, superficial, and the deep. And the, on the other side, this explains the three types, 3A, B, C, and the fourth degree perineal term. It includes both external and internal. The prevalence of anal sphincter rupture is reported in about 2.5% of vaginal deliveries in centers that practice mediolateral episiotomy and 11% in centers that practice midline episiotomy as you see the difference between 2.5 and 11 so mediolateral is more safe the diagnosis of all the complete perineal tear by history taking examination history taking assesses the third the severity of encounterment by assessment of frequency, consistency of stool, and the weather it is gas, liquid, or solid. Past history of traumatic injury, obstetric history of previous difficult delivery, instrumental delivery, precipitate labor. Inability to control rectal gas or feces, especially when liquid. Sometimes the patient is complaining of involuntary escape of latex only. Chronic diarrhea also may occur. During examination, an inspection will reveal the perineal body is absent because it is torn. In its lower part and the vaginal epithelium is continuous with the anal mucosa, which is bright red and appear in the lower end of the defect. The external anal sphincter is only present posteriorly and is indicated by wrinkling of the skin, gabbing the anus, indicate major defect in the anal sphincter, the torn ends of the retracted sphincter are marked by a dimple on each side. Rectal examination, introduce your finger in the anal canal and ask the patient to hold herself, contracting her pelvic floor muscles. To confirm the absence of sphincter control, as you see in this picture, this is the bulbo cavernosus muscle, this is the transverse perineal muscle, and this is the internal anal sphincter. And this part is the external anal sphincter. And this area is the rectal mucosa.
Repair of all the laceration of the perineum, ideally three months after labor, to give time for resolution and the improvement of infection, inflammation, edema in this area. Principles of repair, the following are fundamental principles essential for successful repair. Evidence of good blood supply, number two, absence of infection in the tissue, number three, closure at repair without tension, number four, removal of scar tissue to be similar to fresh tear. Preoperative preparation is very, very important. Correction of anemia and the treatment of infection. Bowel preparation five days before the operation. Give fluid and non residue diet. Intestinal antiseptics like neomycin and metronidazole. Daily cleansing enema repeated in the morning of the operation. Only liquids. 48 hours period to surgery. We are going to do an operation called Lawson Heat Operation, which is a layered repair. We'll do H shaped incision in the skin with the horizontal limb of the edge at the junction of the rectum with the vagina and the two vertical limbs at the side of the two them. The section of the vagina from the rectum upwards and the lateral to expose the structures of the perineal body. Repair of the following layers in order, rectal and anal mucosa and the pre-rectal fascia, external anal sphincter, by using either overlapping sphincteroplasty or end-to-end -end anastomosis, levator in eye and perineal muscles, vaginal mucosa and the perineal skin, then both vaginal back. As you see in this picture, this is the incision, H shape. As you see, we'll start with the rectal and the anal mucosa and the pre-rectal fascia. Then we will do repair for the external anal sphincter and the internal anal sphincter. Then we will repair the perineum and vaginal mucosa and the perineal skin, as lastly in this picture. This is the perineal skin. This is the vaginal mucosa after closure. This is the repair of the external sphincter by the two techniques, overlapping technique as in this picture and end-to-end -end anastomosis as in this picture. Post-operative care is also very important Syrup lactulose 15 ml twice per day is given for the first three weeks to avoid constipation and to ensure that the patient is having soft stools. Remove the back after 24 hours. Five days of intravenous antibiotics like, for example, ceftriaxone 1, 1 gram and ornithazole 500 mg post twice a day. Since the bus is very important and the relief, the pain is given for all patients twice daily using also antiseptic solution. And remember to keep the wound dry and clean all the time. Patients are allowed to take clear fluids for the first 48 hours and for the next five days on low residue diet. For pain relief, we can give non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, especially in the first 48 hours. Remember to restrict your patient no intercourse at least for two months. What about 
rectal vaginal fistula. It is abnormal communication between the rectum and vaginal, as in this picture. This is the fistula between the rectum and the vaginal. According to the size, it can be classified into small, medium, and large one. Small, 0.5 centimeter, medium size, 0.5 up to 2.5 centimeter in diameter, large one, more than 2.5 centimeter in diameter. The anatomy of the rectum is important to understand the rectovaginal fistula. The upper third of the rectum is protected by peritoneum, as you see in the picture. Anteriorly, the lower two thirds of the rectum is extra peritoneal. The middle third is immediately related to the upper vagina, specifically the posterior fornix, as you see in the picture. This is the posterior fornix. The vagina is separated from the middle third of the rectum by the muscular wall of the rectum and the endopelvic fascia. The anal sphincter and the deep transverse perineal muscles distance the lower third of the rectum from the lower half of the vagina. At the level of the anorectal ring, the perineal body is part and the, its attached muscle distance the vagina from the anal canal. As you see here, this is the anal canal, and this is the vagina and the perineal body distance between pores, or separating pores. The interesphenectric plane, one can find the anal glands, which open into the anal canal at the base of the anal crypts. As in this picture, this is the anal gland here, and which open in the anal crypt here, which open in the anal opening. And also in this picture, you can see definitely the internal sphincter is this part, external sphincter which is divided into three groups, subcutaneous, external inner sphincter, superficial, external inner sphincter, and the deep, external anal sphincter. And this is the buborectalis muscle, and this is the ex, uh, escurectal fossa, and this is the elevator in eye muscle, The continence mechanism is very important. The internal and anal sphincter is responsible for the majority of the resting tone of the anal canal. This smooth muscle group has a major responsibility for continence of liquid stool and deflators. The external anal sphincter and the pubic talus, both striated muscles, muscle groups are mainly responsible for the continence of solid stool. The external sphincter responds to the sudden filling of the rectum secondary to peristalsis of the bowel. The buborectalis is a muscular sling that forms the posterior rectal angle. Classification of rectovaginal fistula is six types according to its place. Interior vaginal fistula involves the ilium or sigmoid as they lie in the pouch of Douglas and they communicate to the posterior forms. This part. High rectovaginal fistula communicate from the posterior fornix to the middle third of the rectum. As in this picture. Mid-zone fistula, as in this picture, involves the lower third of the rectum and the mid-portion of the vagina. Lower rectovaginal fistula 
lie at the anorectal ring. Supra sphenectric and the trans sphenectric, as in this picture, this is a trans sphenectric one. Anovaginal fistula associated with anal gland infection, perirectal abscess, Crohn's disease, or previous anal surgery. The etiology of rectovaginal fistula may be congenital or traumatic, either obstetric trauma or surgical trauma or foreign body trauma. Obstetric trauma, like either unrecognized or inadequately repaired perineal tear or suture penetration of rectal mucosa during episiotomy repair, while surgical uh, trauma may be during culpoperineurophy in treatment of genital prolapse or during banhistrectomy. Foreign body trauma, as in this picture, as in cases with neglected visceral. Visceral used during prolapse, in treatment of genital prolapse, if neglected, may cause fistula. Or the etiology of rectovaginal fistula may be inflammatory like Crohn's disease or infection and the necrosis of the vaginal hematoma or post radiation or neoplastic as in vaginal cancer or rectal cancer or cervical cancer. The site of rectovaginal fistula may occur at any level with the vagina but it occurs most commonly in the lower third, generally at the apex of and improperly healed the repair of third degree perineal tear or fourth degree. Symptoms include incontinence of rectal gas, liquid or solid stool, very offensive vaginal discharge and dyspareunia. Examination by local examination you will see signs for irritation, erythema, swelling, discharge, and the stool coming from the vagina. You can, during examination, locate the rectal vaginal fistula and the check for a possible tumor mass or infection or abscess. Speculum examination reveals velvety red area and the traction with Alice produce dumpling at the site of the fistula. Caros test, which is an air bubble test, can be done by filling the vagina with warm saline, then introduce the false castor into the rectum and then still air into the castor. A stream of air bubbles coming through the vaginal water pool indicating the site of the fistula through which a blunt proof can be placed. You can also do a dye test by using a mycelium blue test by injecting a mycelium blue in a follis caster inserted inside the rectum. Then watch where it appears on the posterior wall of the vagina or if you put the tampon inside the vagina you will find the blue staining. Investigation in rectovaginal fistula include rectosigmoidoscopy. I can see the fistula by endoscopy, fistulography, vaginography, and the barium enema. As you see in the picture, this is barium, and this is the fistula, the rectovaginal fistula. This is the rectum, and this is the barium goes through the fistula to the vagina. The CT scan can help to locate a fistula and determine its cause. MRI can show the location also of the fistula whether other pelvic organs are involved and diagnosis of any suspected tumors. The treatment of Rectovaginal fistula include medical and surgical treatment, 
In medical treatment, we treat the infection and the associated symptoms, give antibiotics, anti-inflammatory drugs, antiseptic wash to the area, maximizing medical treatment of the underlying disease like Crohn's or diverticulitis, support of the general condition of the patient and treat anemia, other conservative treatments include non-operative measures to close the fistula like fibrin glue or other occlusive measures, but the success rate of these measures is not high. There are still an option to consider in high-risk patients who are not fit for surgery. So, the proper and the actual treatment is a surgical treatment. Preoperative preparation, as we mentioned before, in complete perineal tour. Remember the five days of fluid and low residue diets, and last two days only fluids. Operation. It depends on the site of the fistula, the cause of the fistula and the diameter of the fistula. If the fistula in the lower third of the vagina, excision of the fistula tract and the cutting the bridge of the tissue below the fistula, followed by repair similar to that of complete perineal tear. A while in middle third fistula, in the middle third of the vaginal wall, layer the closure done when the fistula in the middle third and the external anal sphincter and the perineal body are empty. First, separate the rectum from the vagina to enter the rectovaginal space, then transect the fistula tract, excise the epicellulized tract through the vaginal wall and suture the opening in the vaginal wall and rectum. Let us see in the picture this operation. We separate the rectum the vagina from the rectum first. Then we will excise the fistula. The fistula is opening. Okay. After that, we will repair the rectal mucosa in two layers. Then we will repair the vaginal mucosa here. Rectal wall mucosa and the pre rectal fascia is repaired, then the vaginal mucosa. What about the upper third of the vagina or a very high rectovaginal fistula? Most often, a trans abdominal approach is used for colovaginal or high rectovaginal fistula because of coexisting pelvic disease and the inaccessibility of the fistula through the vagina. However, some high fistula can be done through the perineum. Fistula division and the closure without bowel resection. Interposition of healthy tissue such as omentum may be used to separate suture lines. Bowel resection when tissues are abnormal because of radiation, neoplasma, or inflammation. The successful management of rectovaginal fistula depends on the etiology, size, and the location of the fistula, the quality of the pre- and the post-operative care measures, as well as the assessing the competence of the continence mechanism. Thank you, Dr. Alam Spah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University.